listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. Welcome to Latin America Matters, a podcast about the innovative policies and political debates Latin America has to offer to the rest of the world. Stay tuned to hear from policymakers and experts talk about the research and practice all over the continent, from the Antarctic to the Chihuahuan Desert. My name is Andres Fortunato, and I am the president of LAM, producer and host for today's episode. For our first episode, we wanted to bring Latin American students from different policy schools in the U.S. in order to debate about how COVID-19 is impacting our region in the medium term and how governments are addressing this complex situation. Today, we are joined by Cesar Pavon, Master in Public Administration and International Development at Harvard Kennedy School and also Editor-in-Chief of the Latin America Policy Journal, Diego de la Snyder, Master in International Affairs Candidate at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, SIPA, concentrating in international financial and economic policy, and also General Secretary of the Latin American Student Association, LASA. Finally, we are also joined by Maria Harker, Master of Public Administration Candidate also at SIPA, concentrated in economic and social development, and Vice President of the Latin American Student Association. Thank you very much for joining us today. Cesar, I have a question for you. Where was Latin America before COVID-19 arrived? Can you tell us a little bit about the situation? Latin America in the five past years has proven a very bad performance in terms of economic growth. For instance, our leaders, Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil, have contracted in the last year. This is played mainly for social unrest. We have a lot of protests that have top production, but also because we have declining prices of commodities. Broadly speaking, we can say that the International Monetary Fund is expecting that the contraction in the region is going to be explained mainly by the leaders of Latin America. So this is something to bear in mind. Given the constraints you mentioned, how does COVID change that? And here it's important to acknowledge like three different scenarios. We could have the scenarios that is like a new, where you have like a very big a contraction, but it, you have a very fast recovery. You could have the B, that is that you could have a very quickly contraction, but also a very quickly recovery. You could have the U, where you have a quickly contraction, but it takes one or two years to have then the recovery. But you can also have the L, that is the one that we least prefer, that is having a contraction and maintaining this uh, bad economic result for the long term. So I want to bring the following question to the table. What is this situation going to mean in terms of Latin America's dependency on foreign investments and how is that going to impact our finance and our ability to overcome the social and economic impact of the crisis. We know that over the last two months, approximately $7 billion dollars in investment exited Latin American economies. Brazil is one of those. So I'm thinking that this is going to be a huge problem. It's always been a problem. It's kind of a structural problem of our economies. But in the short term, what policies can we bring to the table in, in order to overcome these issues of dependency in Latin America that will very surely going to get worse after coronavirus? I, I think that it's a, a very good point. And for instance, what the grading agencies have been highlighting in terms of economic impact in, in Latin America is the lack of funding. And how are we going to be able to fund the over demand of resources that this type of situation required? Compared to developed countries, developed countries have access to financial uh, products very easily, as we have this dependence of commodities and as we are very vulnerable to international cycles. Our funding resources has been really minor compared to what developed countries has and in what can be done uh, i think that uh, some initiatives taken for instance for uh, uh, the case of colombia 
where the central bank have made some innovations on how to deliver credit directly to small enterprises. It's a very good way to go. Countries should not be scared of getting more debt. So when we talk about the flexible loans of the IMF and other financial, very helpful tools we can have at a table in order to tackle the problems we are facing right now, it would be interesting to bring up the case of Argentina, who is going through a renegotiation of its sovereign debt and actually is the most important issue in the public agenda right now because in the end, uh, all our development is going to depend on that. As you may know, uh, the managing director of the IMF, Cristalina Georgieva, supported Argentina's position, saying that we need uh, that relief and there's there must be a flexibilization of the debt repayment. When we think about uh, Latin America's dependency on international finance, we really should also be thinking about the legal framework that accompanies the process of debts and the policies that are demanded in order to apply those programs. In terms of fiscal policy, what do you think that governments can do to reduce current effects in the economy? One of the main contrasts between the Latin American region and the Northern Hemisphere in terms of what can be done, while we are seeing very huge stimulus packages in the US or in the European economies, this is going to be way more complicated in the Latin American uh, economies. One exception has been, for example, Chile, which has introduced a very substantial stimulus package in order to reinforce the aggregate demand in a moment in which the private demand is contracting. But for example, as you mentioned before, for the Argentina's government, it's going to be way more difficult to be able to sustain the demand, given that the Argentinian government is currently dealing with this uh, debt crisis that needs to be solved, not only to be able to access credit in the future for itself, but also for the private sector in Argentina to be able to have access to credit. Because basically, if uh, Argentina gets into a default, it would be much more complicated for, for Argentinian companies as well to, to access international credit. So yeah, that's a point of vulnerability for the, the Latin American economies. Also the fact that the American economy is suffering so badly. The U.S. is one of the main trade partners of many of the countries in the region. Also the fact that China also is suffering quite a lot from this situation is also very problematic. case of Argentina, for instance, China is one of our main trade partners in some of the commodities we export, such as soybean, soy meal, and soy oil. So uh, a contraction of the demand from China, a contraction of the demand from the U.S. will have a direct impact in the Latin American economies. I think it's a quite optimistic view, but if you, if you look at the numbers that the International Monetary Fund published recently, you will see that cases like Peru are really outstanding. For instance, Peru already invested 12% of GDP to face to the COVID pandemic. You also have the case of Brazil, which has announced package is almost 10%. You also have the case of Chile that is more than 6%. These type of countries have understood what have already been said. Is don't be afraid of taking the decisions you should do in this moment and these are whatever moment takes. So we should take the dev. And you can see a clear relationship where countries that has created and announced bigger packages have less CDS spreads. In other words, countries that have committed more to fiscal expansion are being rewarded in the market with a positive or a relief in terms of risk. I think this is something positive. It depends on the internal situation. So an interesting aspect of the COVID-19 situation in this sense is what is going on with the geopolitical arena and how is the distribution of power changing in that sense. We, we see a clear loss of leadership in the case of the United States. When the United States was expected to show leadership in how to how to deal with this situation. We see coordination problems, lack of coordination among the different government levels. 
Whereas in the case of China, we see that the country is sending help and medical resources to other countries. We've seen the Chinese flag flagging in Rome, which is a great political statement. And we see that the role the President Trump is playing at the international level is kind of controversial in that sense. So what does this mean for Latin America? Is this a window of opportunity? Is it not? In my case, I think that this has good and bad outcomes. We we need to see how the situation evolves, but that it may be a good time to think more about regional integration. I think that another interesting topic here is to see how the economic policies can also affect the political spectrum. So, for instance, what's happening right now in the U.S. that almost every American is receiving a, a stipend as aid from the government. Sometimes it can also lead to corruption or even to uh, manipulate elections. So, for instance, in past emergencies, when people received checks from the government, sometimes they were not signed as a check from a country, but a check from a specific president. And that could also just deviate attention towards who is providing the aid. I want to ask the Colombians about how they see the coordination between the different levels of government in Colombia. This is one of the most important aspects of the government response in every country. So how, how are the different governments at the municipal, state and federal level working to, to address the COVID-19 crisis? Although it is important to have regional coordination, I think that in order to effectively address COVID, we need not only regional coordination, but global coordination. And we also need to understand that although we need global measures, each country may introduce different policies, not only the political and economic context, but also the historic context. Basically, we are in a very challenging political arena that requires a lot of coordination that it doesn't seem to be a lot of coordination among the national leaders in Latin America. That is something that historically we suffer. Although there have been like appropriate measures regarding lockdown in the country, there has also been some kind of problems between like the national level and some of the local levels. So for instance, in Bogota, which is the main city, sometimes the mayor is kind of contradicts or the president contradicts what the mayor says. So they are having some troubles there. And in general, uh, regarding the, the local authorities and the national authorities at the beginning, it was kind of an issue. And right now, there have also been some disagreements. And I do believe that coordination is key right now. There has been a recent report by ECLAC, which is the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. It, it is a UN agency that works specifically for the Latin American and Caribbean region. The forecast is quite complicated in terms of the situation that might arise by the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Basically, the report calculates 11 million new unemployed people in the region and 30 million new poors uh, or people falling below the poverty line. Programs right now that assist the most vulnerable parts of the population in many of our countries, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, for, for instance, in Argentina, we have a third of the population that works in the informal sector. This means that most of the stimulus packages or measures wouldn't reach directly these companies because they are not registered. And at the same time, there is, of course, another issue with people living in informal settlements where they live in overcrowded circumstances in which social distancing is very difficult to keep. Many neighborhoods in which there is a problem of access to clean water, keeping hygienic conditions and uh, keeping cleanliness is also very difficult. What is happening also in the region is a clear division between the formal country and the informal country. Just to add up, I wanted to say that this situation brings up the question of whether universal cash transfers are or not a solution to many of the social problems our countries face, especially in terms of poverty alleviation and access to basic social rights. Seems to me that now 